I'm Harvey Mansfield, and this is the Program on Constitutional, Constitutional Government, which is a, a small unit in the Center for American Political Studies in the Great Great Green Government Department of Harvard University. And so here we are, and our guest today is Jeb Bush. Um, uh, welcome to Harvard. <laughs> There are some of us who wish you didn't have the time to be here, but here you are. Um, Kennedy School invites um, people who don't win elections to come, and uh, that's, um, that's what's happened here. That uh, uh, points up the difference between winners and losers in elections. This is one thing that Trump has right, that, um, that there is a difference. Um, this man uh, was born in Houston, which is a major city in Texas, the state of Texas, down on the southern boundary of the United States. I, am <laughs> to, want, I want you to show like where you're lacking. <laughs> I, think, I think most people hardly know where Houston is. Right. Call me crazy. It's the fourth largest state. All right. So that, uh, that's a larger state than Massachusetts. Yeah. But, <laughs> and, uh, um, <laughs> but Jeb, uh, Jeb knows Massachusetts because uh, he went to prep school at Andover. I did. And he did that. And then he went to college at the University of Texas in order to avoid having to go to Yale. <laughs> and, uh, after that, uh, well, he moved to Miami, went into business, got married became Secretary of Commerce in the state government of, uh, of Florida, and he was governor of Florida um, on his uh, second try, and he uh, stayed there from uh, 1999 to 2007 with an exemplary record. Uh, in 1998, when he was first elected, uh, his brother George was also elected governor of, or re-elected governor of Texas, so the two, the two Bush brothers were in control of the American South, you could say. Um, as, as governor of Florida, he reduced taxes and cut spending and cut the number of government employees. And he accomplished a public education reform introducing vouchers and charter schools. Uh, he had a plan called One Florida, which um, tried to do something about uh, affirmative action. Eliminated it. Eliminated it. Uh, something we badly need uh, everywhere. And he uh, accomplished tort reform. Um, and, and after he left, uh, the governorship of Florida. He went back into politics, and he was uh, recently a uh, uh, candidate for uh, the Republican nomination to the president. You don't have to bring that up again. I don't know, <laughs> but I'm uh, hurrying because I think I'm beginning to think that this is enough introduction, <laughs> and I'm going to stop and say thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Harvey. I'll give a few brief remarks and then we'll open up for questions. First of all, um, I, always, I always found it amusing that there's this terminology of flyover country. Uh, but after Harvey's uh, very articulate uh, description of Texas, um, maybe we've got to keep using it because uh, Florida and Texas are kind of part of the flyover part of the country, the part that doesn't have an income tax, the part that believes in entrepreneurial capitalism, the part that believes that freedom creates prosperity for people. And lo and behold, a lot of people like to live in flyover America. And the parts that uh, don't have that kind of attitude seem to be, they still have the massive intellectual capital like this incredible place. But uh, the prospects for growth when you try to tax your way and regulate your way to prosperity don't, doesn't work as well. So I'm glad for the introduction because it reminded me I'm a Texan by birth, a Floridian by choice. And I'm still damn proud of our country, not because of uh, the, the elites, but because of flyover country. It's still pretty strong. So thank you for letting me come. Harvey and I were together at the Bradley 
uh, Freedom Award, which was of, in my public policy, public life was the highlight of it, to be acknowledged um, in, the, in the same time as uh, Dr. Mansfield was an incredible honor. Um, and uh, it was fun to be there. It was, uh, it was a blast to be with you. And it's great to be here as well. I'm a, I'm, I'm a visiting fellow, a mini, mini fellow, I think, because I'm co-teaching uh, Paul Peterson's class on education reform uh, for the next, I did it yesterday and for the next two Thursdays, and then fill in the rest of the time to, um, to spread the gospel of conservative uh, politics behind enemy lines. And I'm having a blast doing it. <laughs> it's fun because when you talk to people, particularly young people, that have never actually interacted with a conservative, they may have seen them on a TV show as they're, <laughs> as they're going, you know, trying to find MSNBC and they see Fox briefly. Uh, and you can speak in a complete sentence and maybe use an adjective and an adverb once in a while and have a thought about why it's important to apply conservative principles to <laughs> allow people in poverty to rise up and to allow the middle class to have hope again. You can see that it's, uh, it's the first time they've heard it. And um, I'm encouraged, actually. Uh, last night I spoke at the forum there. Uh, I do think that if we get our act together as a party, and put aside the party, the party to me is not as relevant as the conservative cause, if we have a big, broad, hopeful message, we can compete because it's a winning message. It's a message that you can show with data, you can show with results that, that people's chances to be lifted up exist. And the challenge and the disappointment I had uh, as a candidate was that the whole conversation wasn't about this. It was about the anger and angst that people legitimately feel. Uh, our party has been hijacked. The conservative cause has been temporarily hijacked in my mind. Uh, and for us to be successful as a nation, we need to get back in the game at the federal level. We're certainly back in the game in the, in the state level where Republicans and conservatives dominate. And I think we need to, to, to do it not to point out over and over again how bad things are. I think people figure that out. What we need to do is offer 21st century solutions to the great challenges our country faces. Uh, I believe that this country succeeds when we're a bottom-up country, not a top-down country. Increasingly, the impulse is, I'll do it. I'll solve it in Washington. And they're, they're, not, they're not equipped to do that. A bottom-up country believes in strong families, strong communities, believes in local government being the first place to solve problems. Uh, and that the Washington's role is, is far different than what we've asked it to do. Which is why, and I don't know, I've not, I should have asked uh, Dr. Mansfield before I opined because he's an expert and I'm not, and he probably disagrees with this, but we'll have a lively debate if that's the case. Which is why I've concluded that we need a constitutional convention of the states. That uh, we convene that so that we take power away from Washington, D.C. That we have term limits that we have a balanced budget amendment with a extra majority if, if, uh, if the Congress wants to raise taxes, phase it in over four years, that we limit uh, the Commerce Clause, limit the power of the Commerce Clause so that we begin to get back to what the Founders' vision is for this country, which is a bottom-up country, where we allow for a flourishing kind of uh, problem-solving orientation rather than this static, top-down driven system that now is making it harder and harder for people to rise up. In America today, if you're born poor, you're more likely to stay poor than any time in modern history. A baby bought in the world today in a public hospital in this state or in Jackson Memorial in my hometown of Miami, if we don't alter their lives and change it in some fashion, they will never have a job. Half the jobs that exist today, according to McKinsey's study that came out late last year, uh, can be automated within the next 20 years. The world we're moving toward at warp speed is one of incredible opportunities. Incredible opportunities for those that have the skills to be able to ride the wave. And it'll be devastating for those that can't. 30% of the children in this country graduate or don't graduate. They, they should graduate from high school. Most of them do, 80% graduation rate. But 30% of the students in this country cannot go to college, are not college ready. They go to college, but they'll take remedial work. Uh, or can't get a job, and or can't get a job. We spend more per student than any country in the world. And that's the result we get. Take family life. Take the shattered communities that exist. 
Take the, the fact that business startup rates are lower today than they were 30 years ago. Workforce participation rates are lower than they were in 1980. Take all these data points and then envision what the world looks like 15 years from now when the, the, the um, rapid change based on globalization and technology changes cascades into our life. It looks pretty ugly to me unless we begin to apply conservative principles across the board and reform the basic institutions that, that historically have allowed people to rise up. The more people believe that the system doesn't work for them, the more candidates can f prey on their fear and their, and their angst and will become a grievance party rather than offering solutions to give people hope again. I hope that you all believe in this. I hope that you believe that our philosophy is the one that will lift people out of poverty, that will allow for a robust middle class, that will allow the United States to lead the world in innovation and uh, change, and that we can lead the world, that we're not so pessimistic that we have to pull back, and that we don't believe in free trade, that protectionism is a better, a better uh, policy than, than um, aggressively pursuing our agenda around the world. I hope that we get rid of this incredible uh, pessimistic worldview so that we can draw people towards our cause. Florida's student body population starting about five years ago was majority minority. Today it's about 58% of all students in our K-12 system are um, kids of color. And I'm not a br brilliant math major, Harvey, but that makes me believe that 10 years from now those will be the new versions of millennials and it looks like the rest of the country going forward. If our policies send a signal that, uh, that we're not for an aspirational America, that our party's only for a select group of people, we're dooming ourselves. Demography in this country is changing whether we like it or not. And our message is one that can be embraced by a whole lot of people, but it has to be a much more hopeful, optimistic message rather than a message of grievance. That's my message to you all, and uh, I appreciate you allowing me to come, and I'd love to have a conversation with you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, my name is Susan Schell. I'm sorry, can you wait for the microphone? Oh, sorry. <clears throat> um, my name is Susan Schell. I teach at Boston College, and I consider myself a friend of conservatism, or at least a friend of many conservatives, oh, good. though I don't consider myself a conservative. Um, You've met one. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I've met many, and I consider them dear friends. So I just want you to know where, sort of where I'm coming from. So I wonder if you could, because I was, I was, very, you know, I was very interested in your, your statement that you want, the, about the importance of pro pro providing not simply negative critique, but positive solutions. 20th, 21st century solutions. Yeah. So I wonder if you could, you could address these problems, which are, I think are often put forward as particularly difficult for classical, for classical liberalism or, or conservatism right. as you've been describing it. And one is the problem of infra infrastructure. Um, the US seems to be falling into a, in, right. into a you know, state of decay. And when you think about all the great infrastructure uh, you know, kind of projects in American history, beginning with George Washington and the canal system, and then the transcontinental railways, and then the interstate highway system. It's never been enough to simply d depend on trickle up from local initiatives. And so I'm wondering what, what the conservative solution to that problem would be. And let me just put the second question on the table too. And that is that one of the, one of the frequent objections to the free market, and we've heard a lot about it recently, is that if you simply let markets do their, their work, that wages will, will, will fall to the, the, the lowest global level. And so if you have highly trained people in India or China or Singapore or wherever, the natural tendency will be that even well-educated, highly trained US workers, that their wages will sink down and the others will sink up. But, but in, in, in effect, Americans will see their, their incomes fall, certainly relative uh, to the rest of, of, of the world, or people they, they're used to thinking of themselves as more prosperous than. So how would, how would the free market system uh, deal with the problem that even if we could make everyone Got it. mathematically competent, et cetera, it still might not work? Well, first of all, the alternative 
which is to reject capitalism and free market policies yields a horrible result. That's what we're doing now. So it's got to be compared to something else. Um, but as it relates to infrastructure, there are things that the federal government should do. I don't want to, um, I'm not a, uh, I, I, although I do believe as a society we've outsourced way too much power to Washington. Uh, research and development, the NIH, that's a proper place for the federal government to be involved. Infrastructure, not necessarily to build it itself, but to be a funding source, is a legitimate place for government to be involved. Protecting us, very important. There are legitimate big things that the federal government should play uh, the dominant role in, uh, but most else can be done differently. So. Um, just as an aside, I'll give you examples of that. Why, why do we think Head Start's this, you know, phenomenal idea? Well, because there was a study in one city 30 years ago, and there's been no research since then to, to show anything, but it's cost more. I would trust the governor of any state, if they could get the, the early childhood literacy money to match it with their own money to create a 21st century literacy-based a program to make sure that children come to kindergarten in a cost-effective way uh, with phonemic awareness and being able to do the basic things that are so important for reading to give them a fighting chance to be able to be college ready. I would do that. That would be a priority for me. But I can't take that money as a governor of a state. And so we have no accountability, $23 billion being spent, no strategy, no matching of resources, no compelling kind of argument that this is in the public good. We spend the money and we get dismal results. That, there are scores of examples like that. Infrastructure though, the conservative alternative would be, I'll give you a, I'll give you a throw out an idea. I don't know if this is, uh, there's no, it's not in the party platform. I didn't read it this year, but <laughs> I'm, assume, I'm assuming, assuming it's not in there. We have a worldwide tax uh, system. We're the only, only country in the world that taxes worldwide income. The net result is we have this bizarre consequence of $2 trillion of cash on corporate balance sheets overseas that if it comes back, it gets taxed again. Liberals don't, don't like the idea because they say, of making change because they say that we're taking jobs, they're, we're killing American jobs by, by allowing businesses to invest overseas. Well, they've already done it. And there's $2 trillion of cash. Why not allow for a one-time tax? Donald Trump actually, I think, supports this. One-time tax of, in my, my plan, it was 8.75% to be paid within 10 years to allow the money to come back, partially to reduce the deficit, and partially to be matched with state and local dollars to create an in infrastructure fund. And a conservative would say, we're not going to use the um, the federal labor laws to create higher costs on how you build that infrastructure. Uh, we're not going to go through the process through Congress where you pork barrel it up and you build bridges to nowhere that is part of some strategic uh, plan to create infrastructure of national purpose where it can be matched with public-private partnership dollars, pension funds that we are desperately looking for uh, long-term investments, and you could create a pool of capital of half a trillion dollars probably that could begin to deal with the crumbling infrastructure. Now that's a conservative idea that solves two problems. The gridlock in Washington exists because the left says, no, we, we're not going to negotiate this because God forbid that we would reward a business for taking jobs overseas. Well, President Obama and folks of his ilk are totally ignoring the fact that we're living in a global economy. And this, this tax code that we have is creating these bizarre effects. Um, and the issue, the second issue related to, what was the other one? Wages. Job, wages. 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 You, can't, you can't regulate your way to higher wages. You stifle job growth. You stifle economic activity. The progressive impulse is to say, get, over, get used to it. One and a half percent growth is the new normal. That's all we're going to get. Uh, we'll protect you. We'll try to create a social infrastructure around you that's cumbersome, works for some, doesn't work for others. But you can't, we're not going to grow anymore. One and a half percent is dooming people stuck in poverty. One and a half percent creates declining income for the middle class, far more than wage pressures from other countries around the world. One and a half percent says, basically says economic growth is secondary to managing the economy. And the management of the economy means that we have the Clean Power Act, 
imposed without, I don't believe, without the constitutional authority by the president that's creating a massive rewrite of uh, air quality rules um, based on carbon emissions by states that will make it harder for us to compete. The regulatory environment makes us, suppresses wages because the cost of doing business in this country grows. The conservative alternative to that is to not eliminate regulation, but bring regulations into the 21st century where there is a true economic impact analysis done before you impose rules that stifle investment and stifle competition. If you want to improve, improve wages, reform our tax code, where we have the most convoluted tax code in the world today. Highest tax rates in the developed world, but so many write-offs and credits and you know, carve-outs that we're not efficient. Why not have a flat tax for corporations that is lower than the average of the, of the developed countries and allow full appreciation of capital investing in our own country? That would create hundreds of billions of dollars of new investment in the new industries that we're going to have to have to be able to compete. The world is not a zero-sum game. And this is the Trump message, basically. Someone's gain is our loss. That's not how it works. If you're growing your economy and you're productive, you're increasing productivity, and uh, your workforce is always being um, improved, you can outcompete people. But with a tax code that we have and the regula regulatory system we have, we're never going to do it. And we're going to accept 1.5%. And ultimately, if a majority of people accept that tepid growth, then our entitlement problems will overwhelm us, people will be stuck in poverty, and people will lose hope. And I just, I, I think this is perhaps the most important issue we face. The conservatives got to get back in the game. We have to offer compelling alternatives to this, this slow march towards socialism. And, you know, my disappointment again is this campaign was, if you spoke about policy, it was a sign of weakness. Well, I mean, what, why are we electing these clowns if it's only, if it's about them? I mean, the point is that it's about trying to exert leadership to be able to transform the relationship we have with government in a far better way. I should, or you want to, you want me to do it or do you want to uh, do it? Either way. I don't want to take your job away no, if that. No, you can take it. <laughs> uh, I'm Avi Nelson uh, in the media, radio and television. For those of us who are horrified... Is this off the record? <clears throat> off the record. Your question uh, or my answer? <laughs> <laughs> Probably both. Probably. For those of us who are horrified at the result of the Republican nomination process and now face a dire prospect of a choice between Clinton and Trump, <clears throat> leads us to question whether there is some rectification of the process or significant modification of the nominating process yeah. to prevent something like this from happening again, where you end up with somebody who is not a representative of conservative or libertarian thought, I don't think represents the majority of thinking amongst Republicans, and yet is the nominee of the party. Yeah. Hey, you and me both, brother. I mean, <laughs> so look, this, the, the challenge with this, first of all, Trump won fair and square. So. I'm a big boy, and the other 18,000 people that ran for president, I hope, <laughs> I hope we all we have that in common, that he won fair and square. It was, uh, it was unconventional, to say the least. Uh, I think it does long-term damage for the conservative cause, but that's a subject, a subject that's um, a little off topic to your question. He won, um, and he won in an environment where there was the officialdom of the party um, had an autopsy report. They made recommendations. Everybody was quite excited about the reforms that were put in place. For example, uh, fewer debates was supposed to be a great idea. And on the surface, it seemed like a good one since the last election, 2012, the debates were kind of counterproductive. People were pounding their chest in front of uh, meat, you know, red meat eating crowds and saying things that they might regret in a general election. So the thoughtful idea was narrow the number of debates. Well, it's crazy how the world works. You know, you, you plan it all out and then lo and behold, very first debate, there's 25 million people, 30 million if you count the people streaming, half of whom is, which is four times more, I think, people that ever watched any debate in a primary, four or five times more. Now, half of them were, were kind of going to Daytona Beach for the Daytona 500, and they're at the curve waiting for a massive car wreck <laughs> because that was how it was being touted by the, 
the televisions. They turned it into a, you know, a gladiator match of some kind, so it was entertainment. But no one planned that out. I don't think you can plan by looking at the past to try to create the system for the future. At least we failed miserably this time around. I don't have an answer to, to this. I don't think, um, I'm not a big fan of superdelegates, but that's what the Democrats have done to kind of restrict access to the, to the uh, candidacy. That actually, I don't think Hillary Clinton would have won the nomination if whatever 500 de uh, superdelegates, they're almost all of them pledged to her, uh, weren't there because there was always that kind of feeling, no matter if Bernie Sanders kept going, that she had that in the bank already. It was a powerful advantage that she had. Uh, we don't have any of that. We got Ron Kaufman. <laughs> we, got a, we got one super delegate. So look, there's, there's always going to be a reaction to whatever happened before. And I think prior to the 20, um, 20 election, there needs to be a refocus of what it is to be a conservative. And while there are tough things going on, and it's important to explain why the progressive agenda has run amok. Uh, nothing wrong with that. But we've got to be get back in the game and offering some positive alternatives. Because the world has changed. Here, now here's the good news. This may warm your heart, it may not. We, we dominate outside the presidency. The conservative cause, thanks to Barack Obama in many ways, the wave elections of, of uh, 2010 and 14 have created the largest majority of Republicans at the state capitol, state house, state senate, statewide elected officials, governors since the 1920s. We have a big plurality in Congress uh, in, the, in the House that's likely to stay, and, and certainly in the Senate, I hope it does. So we're, we're the governing party in a lot of parts of American political life. But the presidency, we're never going to win by saying how bad things are. And we're never going to win by sending a message of hate of, you know, Look, I respect people that say this is a binary choice because there's a compelling argument, good reasons to support the Republican nominee, thinking that, you know, but it's all on hope here. There's nothing in, there's no evidence that would suggest that he is going to be different all of a sudden when he becomes president. And my philosophy, my party, my ideology is not one of hate. It's not one that disparages the disabled or Hispanics or says, you know, Miss Universe is fat or whatever. I mean, the stupid stuff that sends this signal that is it's trivial and it's mean-spirited and it's ugly and, it, and it's, it's coarse and vulgar. Um, I actually think the conservative cause is one of hope and optimism. Um, I've been around long enough to see it when it's applied the right way yield huge results for people that didn't vote for us. And we're never going to get there if we send this signal constantly uh, of, of a narcissistic view that it's all about me, you know, and, and we send a signal that some people aren't worthy of, uh, of, of consideration. Not going to work. American politics is not going to tolerate that. And that's becoming, you know, for a lot of people, they hope that there's going to be a change when the nomination ended, if, if Trump wins, which you know, could happen, I guess. Uh, because the other side's got issues, too, in terms of the candidacy and the qualifications there. If he wins, I guess there's some hope that he'll change. I've concluded he won't. Yes? Got a mic right there? No, I'm giving Hi. Thank hey. you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Arohi Sharma. I'm a student over at the Kennedy School. Um, and it's really refreshing to hear a conservative uh, perspective. So again, thank you so much for being here. There are quite a few of us from, from the Kennedy School who are, who are here to listen to you speak. And we come from an institution that uh, strives to create the, the leaders of the next generation. Yeah. Um, so the first year we take classes in negotiations and quantitatives and, and um, statistical analyses. But given that you have such a rich history in, in public leadership, what are some of the aspects, despite conservative lenses, despite liberal yeah. lenses, what are some of the tangible skills that you think the leaders of the next generation need that you would advocate we, we strive to practice? You know, I, I did a hundred, I did a lot of town, I, I actually had a fairly high energy campaign, but it's contrary to that. <laughs> <laughs> I did like 120 town hall meetings in one state, and you know, I was kind of old school, I, I worked basically when I woke up till I went to sleep. And um, the, the question of leadership 
was at the key of my campaign, but it never, it, it, it isn't, uh, it's been depreciated as an as a, as a important characteristic in political life. And it's the most important one. So I'm glad that you're studying it, but uh, it's really important because talking about things, we've got people in our side and their side that are phenomenally good at talking about things, masterful sound bites and managing the, this new media process that is uh, important to do if you're a candidate. But it has little to do about how you draw people towards a cause. It has little to do about taking a stand. So I'll give you an example. Uh, my views are that we need to enforce our, I wrote a book about it and it, my views didn't change um, on immigration. I think we need to enforce our borders. We need to make sure that uh, coming here legally is a heck of a lot easier than coming illegally and that we pick and choose who comes. Sim to simplify the, the immigration policy that we want young, dynamic people, family reunification should be narrowed to spouse and minor children, and we should pick and choose who comes that can make an immediate contribution to our society. And the contract would be embrace our values, embrace the American experience, pursue your dreams with a vengeance, because you're going to create prosperity for us. That's the American experience, and I think to ignore it now, uh, we do it at our peril. Anyway, that's my view. That's the view, that's the view of at least five of the other candidates running for president that I know of, and maybe more. But in this environment, that view was the minority view, that all people here are that you're for immigration or something. I mean, it, it gets synthesized down to, to something that's not accurate. Uh, and so everybody else, maybe other than John Kasich, abandoned their views because, God forbid, would someone would actually disagree with you. Now think about that. You think it's hard to run for office? Imagine being president or governor or mayor. The world isn't all, you can't just live in a cocoon where you're getting your views validated by people that ex agree with you all the time. And that's the part of leadership that the campaigns are places where you're tested. And if you back, if you believe in something passionately and you back away from it because it's not politically correct or it's not going to help you, what kind of leader are you going to be going forward? So the first thing about leaders, they have to have the courage of their convictions and stick with it. Now, could I have gotten better explaining my views that were supposed to be controversial? Sure. I mean, that's, that's, my, that's all my, uh, that's my doing. But to abandon beliefs, we should never elect a person that just goes in the witness protection program because the next president is going to be dealing with a world crisis yet to be defined that's going to require a lot more courage than running for president of the United States a lot more. And I think there needs to be a higher premium in political life for people that show that, left and right. And there are great examples of it. Um, the name of the school is a good example of it on the left, and there are many examples on the right. Um, I would say my brother was a good example of it. As much as he's disparaged by all sorts of people, he stuck to his guns when he thought it was the right thing to do, and that's, that's an attribute that um, people should want in the presidency. The other is to not, uh, not start with the premise that the other person's wrong or the other person's bad because you have a different view. Sometimes we can have a disagreement and the net result is they're just not thinking the right way about it or they're, they're wrong in their view, but you can't ascribe bad motives. So the notion of pushing someone down to make yourself look good, that's the sign of incredible insecurity and weakness. And the President of the United States, when they do that with regularity, we see the result, don't we? President Obama is gifted in so many ways, in so many ways, but the tendency to make, make himself look better by pushing people away has created, exacerbated at least, the, um, the divides that we face as a country. If you start with the premise that you believe what you believe and you want to, you want to advance that cause, but the other people that don't agree with you aren't bad people, they might just be wrong, you're going to find where you can find common ground, you can pause and actually act on it. So leaders don't, don't just talk about things, they actually um, are measured by what they do. That's harder in Washington today, but I think the next president has to, and unfortunately, given the two that are likely to be president, um, I'm not optimistic about this, they have to take the first, the second, and the third step. Presidents, that's what they do. They, they have the humility not to always make it about them, to forge the environment where you can build consensus to deal, look, there are three or four things that are either gonna happen by crisis or they're gonna happen because we have grown up and began to you know, figure out that we need to fix things. 
15 years from now, everybody on Social Security is going to get a cut in their check by 25%, I think. It's happening. It's law. If you don't do anything, nothing's going to change in our demography. Uh, that's a fact. We can be in complete denial about it, or we can deal with it now. The two candidates running for president don't think that the $50 trillion of net present value of the obligations of Obamacare, Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security, the un underfunded portion of Social Security retirement system, is a problem. It's a huge problem for anybody your age, and it's a problem for existing beneficiaries that are going to see massive cuts in their program. Well, that, that has to be solved. You can't solve it by pushing people down to make yourself look good. There's, there's the, the issue of economic growth. You can't solve that by just explaining how bad things are right now. You have to actually make proposals, and it has to be done ultimately in a bipartisan way. Taking advantage of our, of our immigrant heritage to fix the mess that exists and reform it so that it's a catalyst for high sustained economic growth is another one. The president is not involved in education policy, but conservatives better get in the game as it relates to the fact that so few kids are getting uh, prepared for college because in our families, you know, things may be great. That's the kind of attitude, right? Things are going well. My kid's going to go to college. I'm proud of, I'm proud of him or her. Uh, they're going to they're marry someone who probably did the same thing. But if two-thirds of America can't get a job because they don't have the skills to even think critically because they went to a school that never challenged them and they're not college and or career ready, how are they going to get a job 10 years from now when everything's automated? And don't you think that has an impact on everybody else? That's the kind of thinking that we need to have. And a leader figures out a way to allow someone else that doesn't always agree with you to be the winner so that you can move on to fix these things. And again, I'm just not optimistic temporarily uh, that we're going to do this in, in anticip you know, before a crisis of epic proportions takes place. One other point, just as a conservative, uh, this is something Trump said in the debate that I, I, I um, said throughout the entire campaign, and I think he's right. Our monetary policy that, that has existed, uh, just a massive printing of money, is extraordinarily dangerous. And it's a little abstract for people to fully appreciate, but if you're a saver, you get it. My peeps back home in you know, Florida have had their savings wiped out because of 0% interest rate policy. The benefit is only the two people, and this exacerbates this huge class conflict that we're seeing. The beneficiaries of a monetary policy in the here and now are big corporates that can access rich, deep capital markets at near 0% interest rates, and governments. And the fiscal policy of the United States is now secondary to monetary policy. Debt service today in the federal government is lower than it was 12 years ago, and the debt is two and a half times bigger because we've shortened the maturities of our debt and lowered interest rates to near zero. And so it's kind of like Alfred E. Newman economics, Mad Magazine. You're too young to know that. <laughs> I'm glad you laughed, though. What me worry? You know, no big deal. We don't have to fix our structural deficits. We don't have to, you know, do anything with entitlement. It's no big deal because no one's having to make a sacrifice. Well, that's going to turn. And when that worm turns, it will be devastating. It will crowd out our ability to defend our shores. It will wipe out any ability to do anything with infrastructure. And it will create deficits that could create a serious financial impact for millions and millions of Americans. That's not leadership. And that's enabling extraordinary bad behavior. Uh, and there's no price to pay. Incumbents get reelected without, you know, no big deal. Everybody gets reelected. It's all great in Washington. Prosperity reigns supreme there. We're the rest, the rest of us are going to suffer. Yeah. Thank you so much for speaking. Um, I'm here not because I'm a Republican or consider myself a conservative, but because... Are there any conservatives here? I just... <laughs> <laughs> I've been picking the wrong people. Go ahead. I'm glad you're asking the question. Yeah, so I'm here because my father throughout my life has considered himself a conservative. Uh -huh. And he voted for your brother. Um, and I think watching this election cycle has been, yes, terrifying. And I think a lot of people, whether they're Republican or not, hoped that someone like you could have <laughs> taken the nomination rather than Trump. Um, 
And earlier on in the conversation, you were saying that, you know, you in Florida, that 58% of the kids in school are kids of color, and that that's the changing face of America, yeah. and that we need to embrace that. And it sounds like part of the way that you're thinking is that in order for the conservative party to become more relevant and more palatable and, and more effective um, is to sort of embrace that and to, to not ignore that part of the, the American demographics. Um, and I just feel like with this election, I'm seeing two two parts of the Republican Party. Yeah, well, at least two. That it's that it's that the 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 way that you speak sounds very reasonable to people, even who are not conservative, who are not Republican, to people like my dad, who are uh, people of color, who are religious minorities, and but for people of my generation, people who are watching Trump, people who are. Um, don't have the same background, it's pretty scary. Yeah. And so, but I also see that with this, you know, you're sort of, you're saying that you're not very optimistic about Trump and that you're not very optimistic about the Republican Party. And it kind of sounds like the Republican Party is going to need to reconfigure. And so is there maybe some excitement in the fact that things are sort of bottoming out? And that there's, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, actually, and that there's I, there's I'm potential not, to like grow something I'm, new that it, can center people of color. That history is replete of examples right. of, you know, a catastrophe or a problem turning into an opportunity to be a catalyst for change. And uh, this could be that that moment. I'm optimistic about the future of the Republican Party if we embrace timeless conservative principles and apply them into the 21st century. I'm totally comfortable. I'm not pessimistic about that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pessimistic about the gridlock in Washington changing because I don't see, and I hope I'm wrong, by the way, I hope I'm completely wrong, uh, that we gather here a year from now and we see either one of the candidates, to be honest with you, reach across the aisle or f do the hard work of taking their views and allowing someone else to participate, doing the things that make democracy work. Um, or that Trump wakes up and he's a, you know, solid, committed conservative that believes in these things that um, all that stuff, if I'm wrong, praise the Lord. I'm totally happy about it. But what do you do with the supporters well, who don't seem to hear reason, who well, are not motivated by nuanced ways of thinking yeah. about tough issues? Look, I, I am not, uh, I'm not one that says, uh, that Donald Trump's supporters are deplorables, or worse. I mean, she broke down the Trump supporters in two categories. One that you pity, kind of the Barack Obama, you know, in the when he was eating brie and smoking, drinking wine and Salsalito or something, where he talked about how they cling to their guns, trying to explain why it is that people would support, didn't support him, and they cling to their guns and their religion and their jobs. Well, yeah. They are because their, their lives is being altered. You, there has to be a respect for the plight that people are in. And for, you know, for the deplorable comment, which she was trying to be nice on the second part, it was more elitist and more out of touch than the first one, frankly. Uh, that is the wrong approach. We have to offer a compelling alternative and believe in the goodness of people. Look, no, I, I, I don't think that, um, that, uh, that people they're anxious, for sure. And they'll forgive Trump for the things he said. It doesn't mean they buy into it. When he said we should ban all Muslims, or that, you know, and it's always modified afterwards, but he makes the big point that uh, Mexicans are, you know, bringing their worst. The immigrant experience uh, is shared by a lot of people in this country, including me. You know, when you hear this stuff, I get that this is personal, mm -hmm. that this is hateful, that it, that it hurts. It's not political. It hurts your heart. You know, and, and, and for every person that's here, that there's a story that of an extended family, and I can look in this crowd and, and, and know this is true, uh, that he just totally disrespected. Disrespected the struggle. <laughs> 
You want a president that does that? Uh, and then, then offers no alternative, no plan to deal with the problem. Just dog whistle talk to prey on people's fears on the one hand and hurt a whole bunch of people that otherwise could be res receptive to a conservative message. So I'm, I'm, I'm all in on your statement, but I hope you don't lose hope. Because by the way, on the left, there are very similar kind of voices. Oh, absolutely. People you know, are not excited to vote for, for Hillary either. <laughs> but there's voices of hatred, and there's voices uh, that are divisive as well, and preying on people's fears as well. Uh, there are big voices. And so this is, not, this, is, this is not uniquely amongst, you know, the fracturing of the conservative party. It's also uh, across the spectrum that this is taking place. Yes, sir. Uh, Mike, back there. Uh, I'm Ross Terrell in the Chinese Studies Centre here at Harvard. Uh, Governor, I like your from the bottom up and stress on states approach, but there are some things that have to come from the top. And I'm not as sanguine as you about just waiting to 2020 to deal with them. One is the Supreme Court and the other is foreign policy, my, my field, to take foreign policy. Obama has given us, has left us with a shipwreck, an accelerating shipwreck in foreign policy. And I don't believe Mrs. Clinton has the will or the skill and the people she'll bring in with her have even less to, to turn that around. Yeah. Now, uh, Candidates don't always do what they say. Jimmy Carter was going to withdraw all troops from Korea. He didn't do it. And Reagan, until the 11th hour, was going to re-recognize uh, Taiwan. But foreign policy starts at the... So my blunt question is, is there anything that Mr. Trump could say or do in the month of October that would permit you to support him in some way or another? I doubt it. <laughs> look, look it clear, just, just for the, to, to clarify my point about the bottom-up approach to, to, uh, uh, to governing, to ideology, to politics, to the Republican Party, bottom-up to me doesn't mean let's, let's just put local government on steroids. We already have that too. And many of these governments on steroids are about ready to go bankrupt. Bottom up to me means that we become a self-governing people again, that we strengthen family life and strengthen the communities around them and recognize that those are important. And frankly, a self-governing people is more likely to be uh, conservative and more hopeful about their future because they're, they're, they're not going to be dependent upon government. So uh, it's not, this is not shifting power to another government agency. It's just a philosophy that has been a foundation of, our, of the conservative movement, which is that, that, um, that we get this right more when we empower people to make decisions and we create the conditions for them to rise up. Uh, right now, they're being impeded. But clearly, foreign policy is a place where um, it is uh, not just the domain of Washington, it's the domain of the presidency. It's, it's um, not 100 percent, but it's, uh, it's disproportionately there. And this is a place, with all due respect, you're, I'm not, not going to debate Chinese policy with you, because I've learned how to not debate Harvard professors in their subject matter <laughs> areas. I've figured I've been here a day. Um, <laughs> This is a place where Trump has been pretty consistent. So most things, the lack of consistency gives me no confidence that whatever he says, uh, you can believe it. But on foreign policy, he's been pretty consistent, pull back. Uh, he's been reckless with statements as it relates to nuclear power, um, banning all Muslims. We're going to bomb the crap out of ISIS. These are, these are not policy points, per se. These are more emotive examples of, of who he is, I guess. But his general belief is that America's role in the world needs to be negotiated in every circumstance. Got a problem? Got a problem with the Ruskies? Well, let's, let's talk about it. If you, where's your 2%? You know, tell that to Estonia, a little beautiful country 
on the border with Russia that actually has three or four percent of its money uh, invested in in uh, national defense. Or tell that to Poland that's right at two percent. Or tell it to Western Europe where the NATO alliance has created, has actually on a cost benefit analysis has saved us billions of dollars from a cost point of view and created security that has allowed for Europe and the United States to prosper economically. It's, I think it's the wrong approach, and he's consistently been saying this. His, his appreciation uh, for Russia, I think, is wrong. I think it's wrong. I don't think that we should be fawning over Vladimir Putin, who is doing whatever he can to try to undermine the credibility of our own elections and running roughshod over John Kerry. To your point that I agree with, um, I think that Hillary Clinton will likely be a third term of a feckless foreign policy. I don't disagree with that. Um, so I'm in this incredible dilemma where I see, for different reasons, I see two candidates that don't pass the threshold of being deserving of being President of the United States. It's never happened in my lifetime, and God forbid it happens on a regular basis. I respect other people who have taken, made this decision, and they, a lot of people are very disappointed in me for not having a position, but a non-vote for one of those two people is a vote of conscience as well. It is not a dereliction of duty, the way I look at it. You gotta believe in things, and while I respect people having a different view, I see some of them in tortured positions of having to defend things that are not defendable. Yeah. Hi, my name is Heather Pangle. I'm a graduate student at Boston College in political science. And I'm curious to hear more about your constitutional convention idea. It's wild. It is wild. <laughs> um, so maybe if you could say a little bit more about the pros and cons of such an idea and flesh out one or two of the, the things you'd like to see happen. If such I'd, a I'd love to get Dr. Mansfield's view about this now that I've got my courage up to ask him. Um, so. The, the con is it's never been done before. And so who knows? I mean, that's a, the uncertainty of it is, is probably uh, should give people concern. Here's, here's one of the, the, the reason why, um, apart from the fact I don't think Washington's gonna change by itself, it'll either change by a massive, you know, catastrophe of epic proportions, where there's a period when that happens where people are unified for a brief period of time. Uh, or some structural change that's long-lasting that people realize we've got to get back to the business of, of governing, or, or by some form like this, some external force where popular will uh, is, is uh, brought to bear. Why I'm confident that a, article, uh, that a Article 5 Convention of the States could work is that the state legislatures, and this would be full of irony in some respects, the state legislatures are the most conservative they've been since the 1920s. And you have 30 state legislatures controlled by Republicans, most of whom are constitutional conservatives. They believe in this concept. They believe in the Tenth Amendment. They see the Commerce Clause being interpreted in ways where the federal government is regulating things far beyond what the founders envisioned. So there is an appetite for this. And they see the structural deficits from Washington that, you know, ho-hum, no big deal. It's only $600 billion this year. It's, we're still growing, and our deficit's now growing because it's a structural deficit. And normal people see that, and they're ashamed of it. And normal people inside of state governments don't have that luxury. They have to balance their budget. And so there's a disgust, kind of, and there's a conservative belief that our Constitution has been treaded on that I think there is a, there's, a, there's an ability to call for this uh, which would require a, you know, 34 states, I believe, call for this in a way that could be limiting, um, where you could, uh, and the way it would work is the legislatures would appoint delegates, they could appoint as many as they want, they could appoint two, each state gets a vote. Uh, the part that's never been done, but the people I've talked to say that the Congress has a ministerial role of, of um, take, you know, allowing it to go back to the states and then it's ratified. So I think there could be a set of, of um, amendments that would restrict federal government's power and empower people again. That's why I'm for it. And the con would be it's never been done. The, the pro is if you believe in limited government and you believe that Washington's out of control 
and you don't think that they're capable of governing themselves in these governance questions, then this is maybe the only alternative that one has. So, um, you know, there, there are other things you could do that you could, you know, you could have Republican, you have a Republican, a conservative president with a Republican Congress and, and uh, get rid of the 60 vote deal. Just do stuff really quick and get it all done really fast. I'm not sure how sustainable that is. That, that would be helpful if they were capable of doing it and willing to do it. I, I don't have a lot of confidence in that. This would be a popular, this would be the people deciding this in effect. And everything that I suggested probably has a 75% approval in terms of, uh, in the minds of, uh, minds of voters in this country. Dr. Mansfield, what's your position on this? Tell me I'm difficult. crazy. It would be difficult, I think, to limit it in this way. Uh, well, I mean, how, how would you prevent uh, the, the whole Constitution from being called into question? You, you, you can't, the call itself can't limit it, you're right. It's the people in the convention that who you, who the state legislatures appoint that would be the, the, the governor, if you will, the governing, the limiting factor. Um, but yeah, you, as I understand it, it could be a runaway. You could have, you could rewrite the Constitution. That's the, because it's never been done, that, that's the danger. But if you assume that strict constitutionalists conservatives that have a consistent view that haven't wavered are the ones that are going to be going there. And by and large, as you might expect, it's the conservative states that are advocating this, not the liberal states. Uh, the liberal states will appoint people to it, um, but they can't, they, can't, uh, they can't have a runaway. If you have 35 states that are conservative and 15 that are dominated by delegates that are appointed by liberal legislatures, they, can't, they won't have the ability to make it runaway. There are two sorts of people who might cause trouble. The first is uh, ones like Donald Trump, uh, demagogic types. Yeah. And, and the second is uh, conserv uh, uh, constitutional law professors <laughs> <laughs> in the nation's uh, universities. And uh, they're worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, there's no way that I can... Um, have an opinion beyond yours on that. Uh, I guess it, 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 if you don't, if you think everything's fine in Washington, that it's all, it's all going to work out, that these, this dysfunction, I mean, it's been going on for a while now. Things that, that the founders envisioned would happen annually, like passing budgets and little things like that, they happen in a, they basically pass a continuation budget. There's no reforms associated with it. Things languish. The regulatory state is growing exponentially, exponentially. Never, never, no one's come close to the last eight years. And President Obama has realized, look, dealing with Congress, I don't have to. I can pass executive orders on a wide range of things that impact my agenda, and he's doing it. And, the, and there's, there's very limited capabilities of pushing back on that. There's been some successes in doing so, but it is, it is a hyper-aggressive effort to redefine use the progressive, uh, advance the progressive agenda through, through edict. And my guess is that Hillary Clinton will say, I hope I'm wrong, will say regular order way is not the way to go, that the second term of the Obama administration looks like a better path where you use uh, the powers to, 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 of the EPA and the FCC and regulate the internet. And I mean, there's just a wide array of things that uh, where they don't, I don't believe, they have the, the constitutional authority granted to them by Congress, and they're acting on it. So, but the one point that was made about the Supreme Court is the one thing that I, you know, feel really concerned about as well, and my position is in conflict with that, to be honest with you, although I don't trust Trump to make judges appointments that are the right ones either. Yeah. So looking, looking at your tax policy from this campaign, you had some pretty bipartisan um, parts of, your, of, of, of the policy, including expanding the income, earned income tax credit and the closing the earned income, um, the carried interest loophole for uh, hedge, hedge fund managers to declare their income as capital gains. Um, going back to the failed 2013 grand bargain, what, um, 
What do you see as some common grounds that Democrats and Republicans can work on together to kind of negotiate down the debt ceiling? And, and where do you see the Republican Party taking this fight um, to implement fiscal conservatives that the, the left can agree to? Well, I, you know, it's been so long ago, I can't remember what the grand bargain was anymore. Um, I think the common ground could be on these these carve-outs. If you're a conservative, the the special treatment through the tax code is basically a backdoor way. If if we if we think that solar panels should be subsidized, then appropriate money for it. It won't ever happen, but appropriate money, give people solar panels, make it a federal expense. Don't use the tax code because you can't get the appropriation done to have a tax credit. Um, or, so uh, a Republican that advocates the elimination of all carve-outs, all ag subsidies, all, you know, all the stuff that you gotta hire a lobbyist for and makes Washington way big and way prosperous compared to the rest of us and doesn't provide the kind of, generally, the economic impact that we've seen, with the exception of maybe mortgage interest rate deductions, uh, I, think, I think there's common ground because a lot of these benefits go to large corporates and the Democrats don't care about them and you know we should be in return for that though you got to have dramatic reduction in rates that's the trade-off and then on entitlements um, moving towards a means-tested basis is a place where there would be common ground and in return for that gradually extending the retirement rate like a month for every year would be the trade-off there. There's, there's ways to pair up these things to get to the end result uh, we need. Um, one of the things that I did was, uh, it was, I stole it from Marty Feldman, another great Harvard, Harvard professor. You guys are a little long on brilliant Harvard professors at Harvard. Uh, <laughs> his idea was to, um, to give people over the age of 66, retirement age, if they continue to work, and there, there are a lot of people 66 that want to work because they love working, and sadly, a lot of them work because they have to work, to allow them not to have to make the, pay, the employee portion of the payroll deduction. It's, it, it's a small number in terms of the actuarial cost of that, but it has a huge economic benefit of allowing people to not um, fall into poverty. And one of the real challenges we're facing, I think, is that uh, more and more elderly people are, are um, moving towards poverty because of the financial crisis. Their asset accumulation stopped. Interest rate policies have done the same thing. And so uh, providing some incentives like that, I think there could be common ground as well. It, it, by the way, entitlement reform is not going to be the first thing that's done because uh, that's, that's a big, 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 I make, if I'm sounding like it's all simple to do, I can express what needs to be done, but that's a huge challenge. I'll give you some hope. This is something that I um, noticed in the campaign. AARP, which was against anything, and a uh, pretty large, powerful political organization, they came to almost every one of my town hall meetings, and when I laid out my position, which was reforming, preserving, protecting for that, those that have it, and reforming it, they've embraced that idea. And that's, that's important. They've embraced the idea because they see it inevitable. If nothing happens, the members, the, their members and elders in general are gonna see major cuts in benefits. So you, you actually can see TV ads now of AARP on the um, cable channel, which I've seen, that make that point. To preserve and protect the benefits for people that have earned it, we have to, we have to deal with it, uh, make, the, make the changes necessary, and demand that the candidates have a plan. That's their, their, their argument. It's pretty good. Yes. Hi, my name's Jen. I grew up in Oklahoma and taught in Texas, English as a second language, to a lot of my students. Um, one of the challenges that has been expressed in the education reform movement is this idea that there's no single issue voters for education. It's always like number 10 on people's lists, yeah. although we all, of course, want people to be well educated. Um, one argument has been that politicizing education, essentially making it more of a wedge issue, would create voters around this and would allow us to make some progress. What's your initial reaction or thought to that idea? So I think um, education is, 
in the national level is not a top issue because Washington shouldn't have much to do with it. So it, it, it isn't, uh, you know, on the left, th this, the, Hillary Clinton was supportive of some charters and expressed some interest in, you know, incremental reform, I'm being polite, that's about all it was. But she did, the minute, I mean, literally the week she announced her campaign, she abandoned her belief in charter schools and got the endorsement of Randy Wang, the, the two teachers unions. The first teacher union and the second were her first two big endorsements. So there's real pressure on the left not to, I mean, there's an orthodoxy there, you get crushed if you actually have a view that's not the, the one that um, the Stalinists are, you know, you gotta read from the script. Uh, on our side, uh, the local control mantra dominates education reform, and my argument about that is I don't want Washington to be dominating education issues, but I'm not so sure 13,100 plus government-run, unionized, politicized monopolies is such a cool idea either. Because that's what we have, and it dominates education policy, and we've got a pretty bad result, and it's hard to defend the outcomes that we have. So from a conservative perspective, I think we need to be advocating broad-based reform, state by state, and we need to get in the game because this is a huge, you call it a wedge issue, that sounds negative, this is a huge opportunity for a conservative to cross the aisle and make the case that liberals in general dominating um, education policy are trapping your children in failed schools and make that case all across the country. It's the one issue where they can't, you either, I mean, I can tell you what the, the, the rhetorically, are you for the kids? Are you for the adults in the system? You pick, you can't, you have to pick. If you force that conversation, you get liberal politicians just squirming because they have already picked. They've picked the adults in the system, not the classroom teachers necessarily, but the system itself. Uh, and the economic interest over, over the children. And the Florida story is one, and there are other examples, where by reforming the system, creating the first statewide voucher program, the second statewide voucher program, grading schools A, B, C, D, and F, eliminating social promotion in third grade, this idea that you can be functionally illiterate and go on to fourth grade and a good outcome happens, turning the system upside down at you know, that required a lot of energy and a lot of conviction and a lot of fighting, yielded the fastest learning gains of any state in the country. And the prime beneficiaries were kids in poverty, African American kids, kids with learning disabilities, and Hispanic children. Hispanic children in Florida are two grade levels ahead of their counterparts in the country. Massachusetts has got a great education system with great outcomes, but they have great inputs. It's like Harvard is measured, if Harvard's, Harvard's a great school, uh, and one of the reasons, the principal reason why Harvard's a phenomenal school, no disrespect to the professors here, it has, it, the, the students are the best in the world. So how could you screw that up? <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's, if we're measuring, that's not an outcome, that's an input. <laughs> Outcomes are where you start and what gains you have, and Harvard does a great job on that, but to rest on the laurels without actually providing a quality education would be what public schools do. And uh, if you look, if you disaggregate the data, the kids that I mention, are the, the kids that um, are important for the future of America, do better in a state like Florida with less spending than they do in states like Massachusetts, which has a great reputation. And it's because a conservative beat down the walls and advanced the cause for a constituency that didn't vote for him. Now, when I ran for reelection, I got a majority of the Democrat and Hispanic vote. My African-American vote, while, while still paltry, was double digit. It got into the double digits, and I won in a landslide. And part of the reason was that I showed that I actually cared about everybody, not just people that were looking like me and thinking like me and you know, acting like me. That's how a conservative wins. They win campaigning like this, not like this. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, Governor Bush, my name is Matthew. I'm a student at the Kennedy School. I'm from South Dakota, which is real flyover country. You're damn right it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in terms of um, your thoughts on how conservatives can reach out to millennials, which are now the largest voting block, although yep. they may not vote in those numbers, um, if climate change is such a high priority for millennials and there's such a resistance to that um, on the conservative side of the 
ideological spectrum, how do you sort of see conservatives reaching out to millennials specifically on that issue? Because I've noticed um, you're no fan of the Clean Power Plan, so. No. Right. No, so uh, this is, that's why we need to be in the game. I'm against that, but that, if that's the end of it, then that's not the right thing to do. First of all, when I, this, this issue came up because there were, in, in, when you campaign now, there's like, you go to a town hall meeting, there's organized um, meeting people. I see them all the time, they became friends, and they're like, there's like 10 of them. And they, it was, was kind of interesting, they were nice people, they're getting paid to be a volunteer to, to ask a question, and I always ask, let them ask the question because it was a question that the rest of the audience, that you know, they would be informed by the answer I had. So I wasn't, I was totally open about it. And the climate change people came, and they would read from a little script, and, and my first response was, and that's why I'll start with this, isn't it something, shouldn't we be celebrating the fact that the United States has had a dramatic decline in carbon emissions in the last 10 years? We've actually led the, led the world, and it's be, not because of the venture capital operation inside the Department of Energy that made bad investments on about everything that they did. It's not uh, because of any of the EPA rules, because that hasn't been implemented yet. It was because, it started because a Greek immigrant in a private business, through trial and error, took two existing technologies and enhanced them the two technologies are hydraulic drilling, I mean, excuse me, hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling in the Barnett Shale, which was a dynamic marketplace uh, that was created by pure capitalism of mineral rights being traded and created the greatest explosion of natural gas uh, that supplanted coal that created the decline in low economic growth and, and this major disruption of the of the uh, energy sector because of entrepreneurial capitalism created the greatest drop in, in um, carbon emissions. So as a conservative, I, I think the first thing you say is, look, I, the, carb, the, the climate's changing. If you start with the premise that you deny it, that no, no, it's not changing, uh, you, you think the climate's changing. It changes all the time. So from a language point of view, I think the message needs to be, yeah, it's changing. Uh, and so what do we do about it? Well, we need to find over the long haul new technologies that will lower our footprint. But we need to do it in a way that doesn't hollow out our industrial core or make economic opportunity impossible. But acknowledging it, I found, was uh, maybe not enough to persuade someone who had a bunch of host of other reasons why they didn't want to support me, but it got me in the game. And, and I think uh, back to just the future of our party, Another element that I think is important is embracing science and innovation and technology and applying some of these things to solutions that exist should be part of our strategy. I, I, I sense we're kind of, we're, we're dumbing down our message a bit. And um, if, you, if you don't believe in government imposed solutions to everything, then you better believe that there are scientific and technological solutions to a lot of the challenges we face, and I do. In fact, I'm, I bet everything I got that uh, there, are, there are certain, if you want to spend, let's say, you know, we spend 600 billion or something on Medicare, a lot of that is on, on um, illnesses that uh, are gonna be cured. So that scientific discovery and the brilliance of scientists should be held up high as an example of how you limit government and that we have an obligation to use uh, resources to accelerate these cures because it could save a lot of money and improve people's lives and give them a chance to live with dignity uh, in, their, in their last years. That's not a liberal position, proposition, that's a conservative proposition. But if we reject out of hand innovation and science, um, for whatever reason, that's the signal I think, I don't know, maybe you disagree with this, that, that sometimes the, um, what, what people hear, I think we do it at our peril politically as well. Do you, do you sense that, the kind of this? Yeah. Well, yeah, just, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I really do think that the biggest thing, especially for someone like me, who I can be receptive to a lot of the things that you've said here today, um, but as somebody that cares a lot about climate change, if I hear somebody deny the science, that just, rings down the wall instantly, so uh, your message is extremely refreshing. And there's other, there's other 
other uh, environmental issues, conservation issues that have been led by Republicans for, you know, for a long while. And that seems to have um, stalled out as well. Uh, I think it's a conservative value to conserve wild Florida or wild the United States. Um, you know, this is the 100th year of the creation of the National Park System, another federal program, a program, I mean, that's not a bottom-up thing either. And Teddy Roosevelt did this, uh, last time I checked he was a Republican, maybe a progressive one, but he was a Republican. And the net result is we've now protected our natural heritage in a way that is as powerful as a textbook on social studies, you know? I mean, it is, if you've gone to our national parks, including the one uh, just east of where I live called the Everglades, which is one of the most amazing ecosystems uh, that God's ever given this earth, we have a duty to preserve and protect it. It's, it's a conservative value to, to do these things. The degradation of the environment beyond climate change. I mean, one of the challenges, I don't, what I don't get obsessed about climate change is there's a wide array of other issues in the environment that are now just totally ignored because um, climate change front and center is the only thing that matters. Well, there's a lot of other things. Clean water, you know, uh, clean air, the Flint issue. That's an, that's an issue that um, I can promise you that the residents of Flint don't wake up worried about their carbon footprint. They worry about what the water they're drinking. And so there's, there's obligations and duties uh, to apply these conservative principles uh, for a wide array of other subjects that seem to be ignored at the national stage, at least. Yes, sir. Thank you for promoting what I think of as practical principles, um, which were standard operating procedure for a long time, and I think uh, produced pretty good results. Still work in the governors. You know, if you look at the 31 governors, yeah. most of them are doers rather than talkers, and that's... My question is, Andrew important. Sullivan wrote a piece for New York Magazine that posited the possible end of democracy if Donald Trump becomes president, which generated a lot of discussion <laughs> about whether the system is strong enough, can withstand a Donald Trump presidency, and I just wondered if you'd talk about that a little bit, please. No, I, I, look, I, we can survive everything. My first impulse is, we're America, damn it. I mean, come on. It doesn't, it doesn't have to, it's not going to be pretty. Uh, and the uncertainty, I think, uh, of, look, in a divided government where, you, you know, you have uh, the founders, their brilliance was that they created a divided government to keep us from having a, you know, a, an executive that ran wild, that the checks and balances, um, uh, keep us um, keep us free. That still exists. It's been eroded, but it still exists. The place where uh, the the most troubling part of this is the question of commander in chief and foreign policy, and whether a person has the temperament to be able to lead to keep us safe and to lead the world for peace and security for ourselves and for for others. And that's where the danger, I think, lies. Um, that's not a danger to democracy. That's a danger to our national security. I, I'm not saying one's, both of them are important. I don't think our democracy is imperiled if we ourselves don't let it happen. That's, I mean, ultimately this is, one of the, one of the interesting things I've sensed is that people have this kind of a, a, a system of protecting themselves from the madness of politics by thinking it's some foreign ecosystem that's like close to us but not us. It's I, mean, I can feed, I can look at it, but I'm not that. So whenever something happens that's crazy inside that little ecosystem, since you're not part of it, you can look at it and observe it and say, well, that's you know, that's not my my fault. Well, here's the bitter truth: politics is a mirror image. Of our, it reflects our culture. It's a circus mirror of our culture, and we are our culture. We can define how, what kind of government we want if we want to, and we can change our culture if we want to. If we tolerate the kind of vulgarity and divisiveness and rhetoric that is hurtful and, and harmful for our national security, if we tolerate it, fine. We'll get it. If we don't tolerate it, we don't have to have it. The system is not so out of uh, out of whack that people engaged in the process can't change it. And my guess is, and that's why I'm confident that going forward, democracy is not imperiled. 
that that's exactly what will happen. Yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Kira O'Brien, and I'm a freshman in Harvard College. I'm, I came from Ketchikan, Alaska. If that name doesn't ring a bell, it should, because we're the bridge to nowhere town. Um, despite How's that, that bridge working how, out for you? It's not working out very well. Um, in spite of that, however, I'm a lifelong conservative. And as a young conservative, what do you believe we can do from outside the government today as people who've been disenchanted by Donald Trump to redirect our party? Well, there's lots that can be done at the state level and local, run for office. You know, there may be a job opening in Wasilla. No? Okay. Um, there's lots of ways to make a difference uh, outside of government for sure. And uh, it's, it's important, first of all, you know what you can do? You can be a, a self-declared proud conservative at Harvard. And if you have a problem, call Harvey. Because <laughs> he has a lifetime of experience, and so does Paul Peterson, about what it is to be a conservative at Harvard. My experience last night at the, the lecture that I gave was that there, there was no hostility. And I, I didn't like change my views. I, didn't, I said what I believe. It's much safer, by the way, if you ever think about running for office or, you know, being, being a semi-public figure is to say the same thing to every group no matter what, it's helpful. Because <laughs> the older you get, the more you forget, you know, it can get confusing. Oh yeah, this is the left-handed Albanian caucus. I'm supposed to talk about this. I totally thought I was talking to the right-handed Croatians and screwed it up. So be, be engaged, be proud of your, defend your views. Um, the other guys, you know, you get in these little ecosystems where everybody talks, thinks alike and believes in the same thing. They don't get challenged intellectually enough. You can, you can, you can beat them. You can persuade people. Uh, it's a, this, is, this is safe territory to do it. There's no safe spaces here, are there? Where conservatives are like forced to not be a conservative or we don't have safe zones. You have, Harvard's not that, hasn't reached that critical, crazy, stupid place where they're still allowing free expression. And don't be intimidated by the fact that there might be fewer conservatives uh, than, than liberals at Harvard, because guess what? There are, more, there are fewer uh, conservatives in every college. It's not unique to this place. Uh, and this place cherishes free expression. So as they say in North Florida, let the big dog eat. <laughs> be yourself, be proud of it. And it will strengthen you in ways that if you ever get into public life, you'll have a huge advantage over everybody else. One more. Then I'm going to go to Kennebunkport, Maine. <laughs> taking, I'm, taking a, I'm cheating. Getting off work early. Hi, my name is Daniel. I'm a junior here at the college. Um, you talked a lot about how as conservatives we need to promote more of a kind of positive message. And I agree that that's very important, um, both in terms of advancing policy and also um, in like a general election campaign. And I believe that you also did um, promote that in your candidacy. Uh, however, that still did lead to um, a Donald Trump candidacy. So how do, well, so how um, can candidates who want to you know, promote this kind of positive new conservatism still win a primary if there's still this kind of anger um, and sentiment that supports a Donald Trump type character? Well, this, this election was a perfect storm. There's no certainty that it'll be the same storm four years from now. I don't, I don't think, if, we, if the party does its job right, and if people realize that now we've gone, I mean, you think about it, in the modern political era, uh, we haven't won many. Popular vote, we've won once since 1988. Electoral vote, we've won twice, thank goodness. <laughs> so uh, that's not a record of achievement to say that we're going to keep doing, well, just look, here's the plan. Let's keep doing what we've been doing. It's worked out really well. You combine that fact with the fact that, the, that we're not in a static world, that uh, elderly voters eventually go to heaven, young voters begin to be dominant, and young voters are consistently uh, view, view the Republican Party as out of touch. And you have, we're moving towards a majority-minority status in this country. Whether you like it or not, it's a reality. Politics is reality-based in terms of uh, how you campaign. 
And I, for one, believe we should never abandon our views, which is what we've done in 2012. We've abandoned, we've abandoned with our nominee the basic tenets of, of what conservatism is all about. And we've bet on the strong horse. So next time, uh, maybe there's another populist message that's all about the, you know, the big horse again. I don't think so, though. Uh, and whether that's true or not, I would never advise anybody to abandon their principles or to lose their integrity in a political process, because if you lose it in the political process, you're not going to be an elected official worthy of support. This is a man of good sense and good cheer. Thanks yes. for coming. Thank you. Thing we badly need uh, everywhere. And he uh, accomplished tort reform. Um, and, and after he left uh, the governorship of Florida, he went back into politics. And he was uh, recently a uh, uh, candidate for uh, the Republican nomination to the president. You don't have to bring that up again. I don't know. <laughs> but I'm uh, hurrying because I think, I'm beginning to think that this is enough introduction. <laughs> and I'm going to stop and say thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Harvey. I'll give a few brief remarks and then we'll open up for questions. First of all, um, I, always, I always found it amusing that there's this terminology of flyover country. Uh, but after Harvey's uh, very articulate uh, description of Texas, um, maybe we've got to keep using it because uh, Florida and Texas are kind of part of the flyover part of the country, the part that doesn't have an income tax, the part that believes in entrepreneurial capitalism, the part that believes that freedom creates prosperity for people. And lo and behold, a lot of people like to live in flyover America. And the parts that uh, don't have that kind of attitude seem to be, they still have the massive intellectual capital, like this incredible place. But uh, the prospects for growth when you try to tax your way and regulate your way to prosperity don't, doesn't work as well. So I'm glad for the introduction, because it reminded me I'm a Texan by birth, a Floridian by choice. And I'm still damn proud of our country, not because of uh, the, the elites, but because of flyover country. It's still pretty strong. So thank you for letting me come. Harvey and I were together at the Bradley uh, Freedom Award, which was of, in my public policy, public life was the highlight of it, to be acknowledged um, in, the, in the same time as uh, Dr. Mansfield was an incredible honor. Um, and uh, it was fun to be there. It was, uh, it was a blast to be with you, and it's great to be here as well. I'm a, I'm, I'm a visiting fellow, a mini, mini fellow, I think, because I'm co-teaching uh, Paul Peterson's class on education reform uh, for the next, I did it yesterday and for the next two Thursdays, and then fill in the rest of the time to, um, to spread the gospel of conservative uh, politics behind enemy lines, and I'm having a blast doing it. <laughs> It's fun because when you talk to people, particularly young people, that have never actually interacted with a conservative, they may have seen them on a TV show as they're, <laughs> as they're going, you know, trying to find MSNBC and they see Fox briefly, uh, and you can speak in a complete sentence and maybe use an adjective and an adverb once in a while and have a thought about why it's important to apply conservative principles to <laughs> allow people in poverty to rise up and to allow the middle class to have hope again. You <laughs> Yeah. Um, my name is Susan Shell. Can you wait for the microphone? Oh, sorry. <clears throat> um, my name is Susan Shell. I teach at Boston College, and I consider myself a friend of conservatism, or at least a friend of many conservatives. Oh, good. Though I don't consider myself a conservative. Um, You've met one. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I've met many, and I consider them dear friends. So I just want you to know where, sort of where I'm coming from. So I wonder if you could, because I was, I was, very, you know, I was very interested in your, your statement that you want, the, about the importance of pro pro providing not simply negative critique, but positive solutions. 20th, 21st century solutions. Yeah. So I wonder if you could, you could address these problems, which are, I think are often put forward as particularly difficult for 
classical for classical liberalism or, or conservatism right. as you've been describing it. And one is the problem of infra infrastructure. Um, the U.S. seems to be falling into a in, right. into a you know, state of decay. And when you think about all the great infrastructure, uh, you know, kind of projects in American history, beginning with George Washington and the canal system, and then the transcontinental railways, and then the interstate highway system, it's never been enough to simply d depend on trickle up from local initiatives. And so I'm wondering what, what the conservative solution to that problem would be. And let me just put the second question on the table too. And that is that one of the, one of the frequent objections to the free market, and we've heard a lot about it recently, is that if you simply let markets do their, their work, that wages will, will, will fall to the, the, the lowest global level. And so if you have highly trained people in India or China or Singapore or wherever, the natural tendency will be that even well-educated, highly trained US workers, that their wages will sink down and the others will sink up. But, but in, in, in effect, Americans will see their, their incomes fall, certainly relative uh, to the rest of, of, of the world or people they, they're used to thinking of themselves as more prosperous than. So how would, how would the free market system uh, deal with the problem that even if we could make everyone Got it. mathematically competent, et cetera, it still might not work? Well, first of all, the alternative, which is to reject capitalism and free market policies, yields a horrible result. That's what we're doing now. So it's got to be compared to something else. Um, but as it relates to infrastructure, there are things that the federal government should do. I don't want to, um, I'm not a, uh, I, I, although I do believe as a society we've outsourced way too much power to Washington. Uh, research and development, the NIH, that's a proper place for the federal government to be involved. I'm Harvey Mansfield, and this is the Program on Constitutional, Constitutional Government, which is uh, a small unit in the Center for American Political Studies in the Great Great Green Government Department of Harvard University. And so here we are, and our guest today is Jeb Bush. Um, uh, welcome to Harvard. <laughs> there are some of us who wish you didn't have the time to be here, but here you are. Um, Kennedy School invites um, people who don't win elections to come, and uh, that's um, that's what's happened here. That uh, points up the difference between winners and losers in elections. This is one thing that Trump has right that um, that there is a difference. Um, this man uh, was born in Houston, which is a major city in Texas, the state of Texas, down on the southern boundary of the United States. I, am <laughs> but I want you to show like where you're lacking. <laughs> I, think, I think most people Harvey know where are used to this. Right. Call me crazy. It's the fourth largest state. All right. <laughs> so that, uh, that's a larger state than Massachusetts. Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> but Jeb, uh, Jeb knows Massachusetts because uh, he went to prep school at Andover. I did. And he did that. And then he went to college at the University of Texas in order to avoid having to go to Yale. <laughs> <laughs> After that, uh, well, he moved to Miami, went into business, got married, became Secretary of Commerce in the state government of, uh, of Florida and he was governor of Florida um, on his uh, second try. And he uh, stayed there from uh, 1999 to 2007 with an exemplary record. Uh, in 1998, when he was first elected, uh, his brother, George, was also elected governor of, or re-elected governor of Texas. So the two, the two Bush brothers were in control of the American South, you could say. Um, as, as governor of Florida, he reduced taxes and cut spending and cut the number of government employees. And he accomplished a public education reform, <clears throat> introducing vouchers and charter schools. Uh, he had a plan called One Florida, 
which um, tried to do something about uh, affirmative action. Eliminated it. Eliminated it. Uh, something. You can see that it's, uh, it's the first time they've heard it. And um, I'm encouraged, actually. Uh, last night, I spoke at the forum there. Uh, I do think that if we get our act together as a party and put aside the party, the party to me is not as relevant as the conservative cause, if we have a big, broad, hopeful message, we can compete because it's a winning message. It's a message that you can show with data, you can show with results that, that people's chances to be lifted up exist. And the challenge and the disappointment I had uh, as a candidate was that the whole conversation wasn't about this. It was about the anger and angst that people legitimately feel. Uh, our party has been hijacked. The conservative cause has been temporarily hijacked in my mind. Uh, and for us to be successful as a nation, we need to get back in the game at the federal level. We're certainly back in the game in the, in the state level where Republicans and conservatives dominate. And I think we need to, to, to do it not to point out over and over again how bad things are. I think people figure that out. What we need to do is offer 21st century solutions to the great challenges our country faces. Uh, I believe that this country succeeds when we're a bottom-up country, not a top-down country. Increasingly, the impulse is, I'll do it, I'll solve it in Washington. And they're, they're, not, they're not equipped to do that. A bottom-up country believes in strong families, strong communities, believes in local government being the first place to solve problems. Uh, and that the Washington's role is, is far different than what we've asked it to do. Which is why, and I don't know, I've not, I should have asked uh, Dr. Mansfield before I opine because he's an expert and I'm not, and he probably disagrees with this, but we'll have a lively debate if that's the case. Which is why I've concluded that we need a constitutional convention of the states. That uh, we convene that so that we take power away from Washington, D.C. That we have term limits that we have a balanced budget amendment with a extra majority if, if, uh, if the Congress wants to raise taxes, phase it in over four years, that we limit uh, the Commerce Clause, limit the power of the Commerce Clause so that we begin to get back to what the Founders' vision is for this country, which is a bottom-up country, where we allow for a flourishing kind of uh, problem-solving orientation rather than this static, top-down driven system that now is making it harder and harder for people to rise up. In America today, if you're born poor, you're more likely to stay poor than any time in modern history. A baby bought in the world today in a public hospital in this state or in Jackson Memorial in my hometown of Miami, if we don't alter their lives and change it in some fashion, they will never have a job. Half the jobs that exist today, according to McKinsey's study that came out late last year, uh, can be automated within the next 20 years. The world we're moving toward at warp speed is one of incredible opportunities. Incredible opportunities for those that have the skills to be able to ride the wave. And it'll be devastating for those that can't. 30% of the children in this country graduate or don't graduate. They, they should graduate from high school. Most of them do, 80% graduation rate. But 30% of the students in this country cannot go to college, are not college ready, they go to college but they'll take remedial work, uh, or can't get a job, and or can't get a job. We spend more per student than any country in the world, and that's the result we get. Take family life, take the shattered communities that exist, take the, the fact that business startup rates are lower today than they were 30 years ago. Workforce participation rates are lower than they were in 1980. Take all these data points and then envision what the world looks like 15 years from now when the, the, the um, rapid change based on globalization and technology changes cascades into our life. It looks pretty ugly to me unless we begin to apply conservative principles across the board and reform the basic institutions that, that historically have allowed people to rise up. The more people believe that the system doesn't work for them, the more candidates can f prey on their fear and their, and their angst and will become a grievance party rather than offering solutions to give people hope again. I hope that you all believe in this. I hope that you believe that our philosophy is the one that will lift people out of poverty, that will allow for a robust middle class, that will allow the United States to lead the world in innovation 
and uh, change, and that we can lead the world, that we're not so pessimistic that we have to pull back, and that we don't believe in free trade, that protectionism is a better, a better uh, policy than, than um, aggressively pursuing our agenda around the world. I hope that we get rid of this incredible uh, pessimistic worldview so that we can draw people towards our cause. Florida's student body population starting about five years ago was majority minority. Today it's about 58% of all students in our K-12 system are um, kids of color. And I'm not a br brilliant math major, Harvey, but that makes me believe that 10 years from now, those will be the new versions of millennials and it looks like the rest of the country going forward. If our policies send a signal that, uh, that we are not for an aspirational America, that our party is only for a select group of people, we're dooming ourselves. Demography in this country is changing whether we like it or not. And our message is one that can be embraced by a whole lot of people, but it has to be a much more hopeful, optimistic message rather than a message of grievance. That's my message to you all, and uh, I appreciate you allowing me to come, and I'd love to have a conversation with you. Thanks.